sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So instead of fear, there is now a paternal relationship that exists between the Christian and the thrice holy God. There's no fear between you as his child and the thrice holy God. And so we call out to God as our Father. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. God sent his son to redeem us under the law, the law that we could not keep, in order to make us sons through his adopting grace. The son's obedience to the law enables us to become children of God. God sent his son to make us sons. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it will not use the term adoption as sons, but you will see that we become children of God. You know the passage very well, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We are children of God because of God's will. Because of his will, we receive Christ and we become children of God. We are children because it is the will of God that this relationship exists. And so this following week, as you are going through whatever providence brings you, Think of this, that because of God's will, you now have the thrice holy God and each member of the Trinity you have a special relationship to. But in this, we are looking at, you can now call him Father. You are his child because of him. Ephesians 1, verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to his kind intention of his will. Our adoption as sons was predestined. That is an amazing statement that has huge practical ramifications. So we were predestined by the Father in Christ according to what? Because Lee is such a godly man? Because of his kindness. You are his son or daughter because of the very kindness of God. This is to say that our adoption was not by accident. Your adoption was not based upon some quality that God was attracted to you by. But it is because God is kind and gracious, and merciful. So how, with this, with those four verses in mind, how should we view adoption? How should we view adoption? Thomas Watson wrote of adoption, we have enough in us to move God to correct us. Nothing to move him to adopt us. So there's enough sin in us to move God to correct us, but there's nothing in us to move God to adopt us. And so he says, therefore, exalt free grace. Bless him with your praises who hath blessed you in making you his sons and daughters. So let's talk about a proper view of adoption. At a certain time in our lives, Stacy and I looked at our circumstances. We looked at the needs around us, and we were moved 
to adopt children. In the realm of time and space, we responded to circumstances. And we adopted children who were of the same nature as us. When we adopted our four children, we brought into our family. They were humans who were like us. Uh, They were made in the image of God. They were sinners. And they needed the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Yes, we as parents were saved, but they, like us, were made in the image of God. But that image was marred by the fall. And that image was even further marred by their daily behavior, their daily thoughts, their daily speech, their daily activities. They had a sin nature, and every day they manifested that nature. They, like us, needed the grace of God in their lives. They needed salvation, They needed a new heart. They needed forgiveness. They needed an alien righteousness. So when humans adopt, it is a decision that is made in time and space, typically in response to some sort of circumstances. And we are bringing into our homes children who are of the same likeness or same nature as we are. Human adoption is a horizontal relational change. It's horizontal. When it comes to the Father adopting us, we aren't looking at a horizontal change. We are looking at a vertical relational change. And when we say the word vertical, that is something God has done for us. It is packed with theological truth. And it is rich in mercy and in grace. Now, it is not my plan to to look at total depravity. We kind of looked at total depravity in our two studies on Psalm 2. But to understand our adoption as sons, we have to see it within the context of total depravity. We need to see it within the context of our sin. We need to see it in the context of our relationship prior to being saved by Jesus Christ. So with our understanding and recent study of total depravity, I want to seek. Did you hear that word? To seek. (laughs) To illustrate how we are to view our adoption from the Heavenly Father. This illustration is incomplete. It has flaws in it as we seek to understand this divine vertical transaction that took place by a human story. So oftentimes, our view of the grace of God in adoption looks something like this. Mom and dad go into an orphanage. And their hearts are stirred by seeing all the children. They look around and their eyes behold this boy or this girl and their hearts are automatically for whatever reasons, but their hearts are knit together to this particular child. And so, in response, they they set their hearts and their affections on this child. They commit to provide and protect and nurture this one. They give their child their last name. Orphanage to familial love. That is how we often view our adoption as sons. Now that may be true in some sense of our human adoption, the horizontal relational change, but this is not true of the fathers adopting us, that vertical relational change. Rather biblical The biblical grace of adoption is like this. And again, it's an illustration. It it breaks down at some point. It's it's incomplete. 
a human illustration cannot capture all the nuances of what God does, can it? But it gets us closer to an understanding of grace. So here it goes. There's a ruler of a land, of a realm. He has a son. His only son. And there are people in his realm who are rebelling against him. So he sends his son to deal with his insurrection. As he dispatches his son to deal with his insurrection, he knows of a plot by some of the people who will kill his son. And yet, the father sends the son. The son arrives on the scene to do the father's will, and he does exactly as the father laid out for him. But the people did not want the son to rule over them. So what did they do? They murdered him. Local officials responded by locking these insurrectionists up in prison. They put him down in the darkest and lowest parts of the prison. The ruler of this realm, the father of the son, arises and goes to the prison. The prison guards at the father's command brings these insurrectionists out to be let out of their cells and to be escorted to the public square. The public square is where they execute the prisoners. These murderers get to the place of execution. The people in the city know the actions of these criminals, so they stop in order to see the justice of the ruler. However, instead of a sword or a rope or a guillotine, the father orders royal robes to be brought to these murderers so that they would be clothed in royalty. So that they would be clothed in his royal robes. Robes that belong to the father. And then the ruler of the land silences the crowd with a motion of his hand and declares in the hearing of all, Today I have adopted these to be my sons. No longer will they be seen as murderers, but they will be seen as children of the king. That's the grace of God in adoption. That illustration shows us the grace of God in adopting those who killed his son. He did not adopt the lovable. He did not adopt his friends. He adopted children of wrath. He adopted enemies. We were the haters. We were the ones that would have joined the crowd in yelling, crucify him. These are the ones that Jesus Christ came to save from the Father's decree to adopt us. Again, this illustration fails to consider that the whole plan of adoption happened because it is the eternal decree of God. The plan of adoption, the eternal plan of adoption, included from eternity past the killing of His Son. It was the Father's decree and the Son's willingness that makes our adoption possible. Jesus was the avenue in eternity past in the plan of the triune God to adopt us. And so when we think of adoption, you can't think of it apart from the cross. And if you think of the cross, you have to think why the cross took place. The cross took place because of my wickedness, because of my sin, because I was an enemy, because I was a child of wrath. I wasn't that cute boy in that orphanage. There was nothing in me that was worthy. Jesus was sacrificed so that we would become the Father's Son. Oh, the riches of the grace of our God. Now, this wonderful act of adoption can only be understood when we see the thrice Holy God is the one who is adopting wicked sons of disobedience. Listen, our adoption should shock us. 
And it should amaze us that God would set His love and His kindness and His mercy and His grace by sending His Son so that we would be changed from enemies to children of God. So that we could cry out, Abba, Father. Even John understood this. 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we have become what? Children of God. There's an amazement. There's a shock. Every morning we should wake up and as we say these words in prayer, Heavenly Father, get to call God my Father. This truth of adoption would be audacious had it not been revealed to us in the Word of God. Can you see the grace of God and the kindness of God in changing us from children of wrath and sons of disobedience to becoming children of God in Jesus Christ. So if you're in Christ this morning, I want you to know that God in His infinite, free, unmerited grace not only saved you and forgiven you, not only did He save you by, and make you a new creation, not only did He give you His Son's righteousness, not only did He give you the Holy Spirit, not only did He glorify you, but He changed your relationship to Him. You are now His child through this marvelous grace of adoption as sons. And listen, this relational change will never, ever, ever change. You are permanently in the Father. So having this picture of the grace of adoption, that grace of adoption is not, oh, look, she's beautiful, let me go save her. But grace is seeing the wickedness, and in, because of that wickedness, he is moved out of grace and mercy and kindness to save us. Now that we understand that, let's begin to seek to define adoption. One theologian wrote, that adoption is God's act of making otherwise estranged human beings part of God's spiritual family by including them as inheritors of the riches of divine glory. Now right there you can say hallelujah and go home. Did you see what he said? It's God's act that takes us from estranged family and brings us into God's spiritual family by, now watch this. I don't know if your heart's being stirred yet, but it's going to get better. And he makes you inheritors. Inheritors of the riches of divine glory. Listen, adoption as sons just doesn't make you a child of God. It comes with all the privileges of the child of God. Adoption, another one wrote, Adoption of sons is an act of God whereby he makes us members of his family. Now, one way to understand adoption is to understand how it's different than regeneration. Regeneration changes our nature. Adoption changes our family status. So one changes our nature. The other one changes our family status. Because of Christ, we are transferred from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, but not just as citizens. We're not just citizens of this eternal realm, but we are sons of this eternal realm. Now, justification, that changes our legal status in regard to our righteousness. But adoption changes our family status. It changes our family name. And so you can see how they're different. 
some of these are legal transactions. Others is a familial, a family transaction that makes us have a different status to our father. Question 37 in the Baptist Catechism says that adoption is an act of God's free grace by, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Did you, did you, did you hear that? And we have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. We used to be part of Satan's realm, condemned, estranged from God, and now that he's adopted us as sons, we have all the privileges that flow from being a child of God. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And again, this is one of those texts that we're going to talk about just for a few minutes. Romans 8. We already looked at verse 15. I'll just read that for the context. Romans 8. It says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we might also be glorified with him. So we, we have the spirit of adoption. We cry out, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit who indwells us, testifies that we are the children of God. And did you see verse 17? If you're children, you're heirs. You're heirs of God. And you're joint heirs of Christ. So do you see that this family status change doesn't just say you're now a child of God and you get to call him father, but it comes with all of these divine privileges of grace that are found in Jesus Christ himself. So because of our adoption, God is our father. We are the children of God. Because of our adoption, we have the favored position in the royal throne room. Because of our adoption, we all have the privileges of sonship. Our adoption makes us sons of God, and as sons of God, we are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. Does that blow you away? That is an amazing statement that we are joint heirs or fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. Remember our total depravity? And now in adoption, we are joint heirs with Christ. Christ has been given all things. He is heir of all. And now we join in with him. Can you see the grace of adoption? Now, if you are downcast today, if you go through a period this week where your soul is discouraged and there's a shadow of darkness over this, please know that if you're in Christ, you have been adopted. And as an adopted child, you have all the privileges of sonship. That ought to change us, shouldn't it? It should lift our gaze into heaven and say, God, I can't fully grasp all of this. This is too good. I don't understand all these privileges, do you? Do you fully understand what it means to be a joint heir with Christ? God, I don't get it all, but I know enough to know that this is good. And it's, I know enough to know that your favor has been set upon me. And I know as my father, you will never leave or forsake me. So we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And this is why the Puritans understood Christ and they called Christ our elder brother. Our elder. And when I say elder brother, I mean capital E, elder. Capital B, brother. He is better than us. 
It is because of his sacrifice and because of what he's done for us on the cross that we are adopted, but we are still his brother. Do you remember what Jesus said in the Gospels? He referred to those who kept his commandments as his brothers. You can see this in Romans 8, 29. You can see this in Hebrews 2, 11. That Jesus is our brother. Does that excite you? Does that level you? It does both, doesn't it? So the Puritans understood that Jesus has a relationship to us because of this adoption that brings us close to him, and he is our brother. But they also understood that human nature often becomes too familiar with the holy, and they don't see him in the right manner. That's why he is called our elder brother. Jesus is to always be viewed in this relationship with reverence and awe and not familiarity. Jesus, because of our adoption as son, is our elder brother. Now what I'm going to do, because we're at a good spot to stop, I'm going to give you three quotes. I want you to listen to these quotes. All they're doing is they're bringing back into our minds elements that we've been talking about the whole time. One wrote about adoption. God is an adoptive father. Jesus, our elder brother, is God's eternal, only begotten, natural son. Now watch this. And as sons, we enjoy all the rights and privileges of the relationship that the God, the father, enjoys with his eternal son. So as adoption, as a son and a daughter, because of the work of Christ, we now have all the privileges, all the the rights, and all the enjoyments that the Father enjoys with the Son. What else do we need? Everything has been given to us in Jesus Christ because of the love of the Father. William Perkins wrote of the greatness of our adoption, the child of God by grace has Jesus Christ to be his elder brother, with whom he is fellow heir in heaven. He has the Holy Ghost also for his comforter and the kingdom of heaven for his everlasting inheritance. We have everything because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ by making us his sons. Another Puritan sums up our study well. He says this, Adoption is the taking of persons that are strangers and undeserving in themselves into a state and relation of sons and heirs, bringing them into a new family and condition. And such is the adoption of the sons of God. It is a translation of called and sanctified souls out of the family of Satan and into the family of God. Adoption as sons is a glorious vertical relational change that takes place because of the grace of God. So the plan, next Lord's Day, I'm going to seek to continue in our study on adoption, and here's something, I'm going to prime your pump so that you could think and pray about these things and do your own study. What we want to do is, is see where, because I believe it's very profitable, we want to see where theologians put adoption as sons in the order of salvation. So, for example, we know what comes first, regeneration or faith. Regeneration, right? Regeneration enables our faith. So when this, where does adoption fit, and what's the spiritual benefit to you to know this? I also want to look at adoption as sons and why it doesn't say and daughters. Did you notice that? 
It's always adoption as sons. Why doesn't it say adoption as sons and daughters? So we want to seek to understand what is, what is the theological truth being conveyed there. And then what we want to look at, if we have time, is we want to look at how adoption causes sanctification in our lives. Instead of saying, well, the fa- God's my father, I can do anything I want. How adoption actually produces in us a desire and a hunger and a thirsting to please our father. So it gives us a little path where we're going to go. And of course, as you know, when you study God's word, things might change and alter. So we may come next Sunday, that might be changed a little bit, but that's the general plan. All right, let's pray. Our God and our father. We thank you this morning for loving us. So undeserved. God, we thank you for your love toward us in sending Jesus Christ, your son, so that we could, by his life, death, and resurrection, become your son and daughters. God, we ask you this morning that you would cause us today and this week to know better more intimately the graces that we have because of what you have done for us. Lift our gaze this week to see the privileges we have in being joint heirs with Jesus Christ, our elder brother. God, we pray now that as we go into the worship service, God, that you would bless our pastor. We ask that we'd use him to speak to us your truth, make us good listeners. Make us, Father, listeners who are not just here to to participate, but, God, that we would be hearers to do. God, whatever your word tells us to do this morning, give us the grace and the desire to obey. And, God, may you bless our fellowship together. It is so good to be back together as a body. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.